Thank you all for joining me. I am your host, Sam, and today we're going to be talking about the case of Melissa Ann Shepard, also known as the Internet Black Widow. Today's video deals with topics like drugs, sexual assault, abuse, and murder, so if you feel that you are unable to handle these topics, please turn back now. After mating, the female black spider often eats its male partner. This is where the term black widow originates from. In the human world, black widows are women who take their partner's lives for any number of reasons, but typically for financial gain. The story I'm about to tell you today is about one of those particularly deadly women. Melissa Ann Russell was born on May 16, 1935, in Burt Church, New Brunswick, Canada. Most people called her Millie. Not much is known about her upbringing, but from a young age, she never did quite fit in with the small village she was raised in. Despite its population of less than 2,000, Melissa dreamed of living the luxurious life of a city girl. In 1953, when Melissa was around 17 or 18 years old, she moved to Ontario to live with her aunt. From there, she completed high school through evening classes at the nearby Stafford College. Two years later, in 1955, Melissa would meet the man who would eventually become her first husband, a factory worker named Russell Shepard. The pair had two children together, and they tried to have a happy, normal marriage, but Melissa had bigger goals. From 1970 to 1985, Melissa used four different names to rack up what amounted to 30 different counts, including fraud, forgery, impersonation, and even littering for some reason. I don't know how you get caught for littering, but she did in Ontario, Toronto, and Prince Edward Island. She was charged and convicted for all of these crimes, so I'm not sure if these were individual sentences or she was charged for all 30 crimes at once. Regardless, she spent over five years in jail and was released in December of 1985. After her release, Melissa returned to Prince Edward Island, determined to never be caught for her crimes again. However, her future crimes would not be as harmless. In 1988, 53-year-old Melissa met a man named Gordon Stewart, who was selling property on the island. He was 42 years old and just out of the army, and incredibly lonely after his wife's passing from cancer almost three years prior. Melissa claimed she was a devout Christian to win Gordon over, and the two soon began a romantic relationship. Gordon's siblings were initially excited for their brother to be taking another attempt at love, considering how broken his previous wife's death had left him. That quickly changed, however, when they began to hear rumors swirling around town about Melissa. In fact, a member of the town's police force warned Gordon's brother-in-law about Melissa's lengthy criminal history, saying that Gordon needed to keep an eye on his money when she was around. You see, Gordon had a pension as well as $50,000 saved up in his bank account, and it's likely that Melissa's goal was to get this from the beginning. But nothing anyone could say to Gordon would make him leave his newly found love. In 1990, the two got married in Las Vegas before flying home to Canada and having a second ceremony in Vancouver. However, trouble in paradise was quickly brewing. Gordon's family felt he just wasn't the same anymore. He began to suffer both physically and financially from a newly adopted drinking habit and pension for drugs. He began to pass out often and even ended up in jail at least once because of his heavy drinking. He rapidly lost weight and ended up in the hospital multiple times. On one instance, just before Christmas, Gordon became delusional and was found foaming from the mouth on the floor a couple hours later. When he was taken to the hospital, doctors found benzodiazepines in his system. For those of you who might not be aware, benzodiazepines are a type of drug that can cause sedative, tranquilizing effects on whoever takes them. They are typically prescribed for seizures, anxiety, or muscle spasms, though there are a few other medical uses. However, in recent years, they have become used and abused in a recreational sense. In 1991, Gordon was charged with assaulting Melissa, and he pled guilty. Not much is known about the details of this particular situation, but Melissa visited him in jail for some time. However, when Gordon was released on probation, he was ordered not to contact Melissa. Over the next few weeks, though, Melissa repeatedly reached out to him, breaking their no-contact order. The couple began to reconnect and decided that a change of scenery was exactly what they needed in their relationship. On April 20th of 1991, the two moved to an apartment building in Dartmouth, Nova Scotia, and began to settle back into their relationship together. But like before, this newfound happiness would not last very long. Just one week later, on April 27th, Melissa and Gordon went out on a Sunday drive through the rural roads near their new buy home. 
According to later reports, Gordon was heavily sedated on two different types of benzodiazepines, which were not prescribed to him. His sedation was so heavy, he was almost comatose. According to toxicology reports, this dosage would likely have been lethal. However, according to Melissa, when the two were parked on an abandoned road, Gordon was somehow still able to attack her, and he tried to force himself onto her. When she was able to escape, she ran him down with their car, killing him. It wouldn't be another three hours until Melissa walked into a police station, though she didn't report his death immediately. Instead, she told police that she had been raped. She added in that she had accidentally killed her rapist afterward. Police were skeptical from the beginning. If she had accidentally ran over her husband, why not remain at the scene and call police immediately afterward? Why come in three hours later? It was incredibly suspicious. Medical tests confirmed that Melissa had not been raped. Side note, though situations like this do definitely happen a lot, I think it is disgusting that Melissa tried to lie about rape to justify what she had done. I always want to believe the victims, but in this case, I do not believe Melissa was the victim. Gordon was basically comatose and dying from the drugs in his system. It seems incredibly unlikely that he would have been able to speak, let alone try to attack Melissa. Regardless, she still applied for pension benefits on Gordon's behalf after his death. It was during this time that her divorce with her first husband was eventually finalized. In May of 1992, Melissa was convicted of manslaughter and was sentenced to six years in jail. However, she only spent about two of that behind bars. In prison, she formed a support group for women who were victims of abuse and began to use her case in an attempt to find fame. In March of 1994, she was featured as one of the prime suspects in a national film board documentary called When Women Kill. She was released in 1994 with full parole and made public appearances and became sort of a poster girl for battered women. She even set up a toll-free counseling line for women in jail. Because she discussed the subject of her own sexual assault, most people did not feel it was right to challenge her story and many others saw her news appearances and just kind of believed her. However, this reformed image would not last very long for Melissa. In April of 2000, she decided to attend a Christian retreat in Florida, where she met 80-year-old Robert Friedrich. Robert was a retired engineer whose wife of 53 years had passed away the year prior. He was still grieving and felt that this retreat would bring him some peace. It would unfortunately bring him quite the opposite. Melissa claimed that when she saw Robert, the Lord told her that he was to be her next husband. When she went home, she sent him a letter along with a picture of herself stating, quote, God wants us to be married. Soon after, Robert responded and Melissa returned to Florida to visit him. Three days later, the pair were engaged. A little over a month later, on June 23rd, the pair were married in Dartmouth, Nova Scotia, where Melissa had killed her ex-husband, Gordon. At the time, Robert's children were confused. They had not met or even heard of Melissa and wondered why a woman would want to marry their elderly father so quickly. They believed that Melissa was, quote, either very unstable or she's out to get into something no good. Robert called his son, asking for his blessing on the marriage, but Robert's son did not feel comfortable as he had not even met Melissa and was worried his father was rushing into something over his head. Robert apparently told him he was old and just wanted to get married because he didn't think he had a lot of time left. But unfortunately, Robert's son's worries were true. Robert and Melissa went on a five-month honeymoon across the United States, as well as a luxurious Caribbean cruise, which took a hefty chunk out of Robert's life savings. The total of their spending is estimated to be around $250,000. The two then settled into Robert's home in Bradenton, Florida. In March of 2001, less than a year after their marriage, Robert's family began to notice changes in their father's behavior. His speech was often slurred, and he was frequently in the hospital. During this time, Melissa was somehow able to obtain two separate prescriptions for the drug lorazepam, which falls under the class of benzodiazepines. Police records show that Melissa was able to get a prescription from one doctor and then another prescription from a different doctor within 30 days on six separate occasions. By July 2002, Robert's children were beginning to grow even more worried. One of his sons called the Elder Abuse Line, launching a complaint against Melissa for the suspected drugging of his father. Unfortunately, on December 16th, Robert passed away from apparent cardiac arrest. However, 
this death certificate was somehow confirmed by a doctor over the phone who did not examine the body. No autopsy was done and his body was cremated. A few months prior to his death, Robert had written his will, making Melissa the lone beneficiary. And after his death, she continued to receive his social security checks. In 2003, Florida police began to investigate Melissa's prescription fraud, and soon after, in 2004, Canadian authorities launched their own investigation into Melissa for other counts of fraud. The Florida case was eventually dropped because they felt they were unable to prove the charges. However, by this time, the internet was proving to be more than just a fad, and even someone of Melissa's age was making use of it. She began to speak with as many as 20 different Canadian and American men online. Despite Canadian authorities visiting her home to question her about the fraud charges, Melissa had already set her sights out for a new man. In November of 2004, she drove from Canada to Florida to meet 73-year-old Alex Strategios, a divorced diabetic man whom she'd met on AmericanSinglesDating.com. On the 5th, the pair headed to dinner and then went back to Alex's place, and Melissa claimed she did not have anywhere to stay. She basically moved in with him on that first night. Alex told her that he only had one bed ahead of time, and she did not seem to mind, and the two eventually slept together on that first night. But immediately something was not right. Alex woke up in the middle of the night to use the bathroom, but his vision was blurry, and he passed out. He fell and hit his head pretty badly, and was taken to the hospital. Over the next two months, Alex would end up in the hospital eight times from similar strange circumstances. While in the hospital, Alex signed his power of attorney over to Melissa, which concerned Alex's son. His son also saw benzodiazepine in his father's blood tests, which he knew was not something that his father was prescribed. And even more shockingly, he noticed about $18,000 missing from his father's bank account, which had been siphoned by Melissa through the power of attorney. In January of 2005, police arrested Melissa and charged her with theft, forgery, and exploitation of the elderly. A month later, Nova Scotian police issued a warrant for Melissa's arrest due to fraud against the Canadian government that took place between 1997 and 2003. That March, Melissa pled guilty to seven charges relating to Alex, including three counts of grand theft from a person 65 or older, two counts of forgery, and two counts of using forged documents. But through a plea deal, she was only sentenced to five years in jail. However, in 2009, the Canadian charges against Melissa were dropped, as they did not feel they had received enough evidence to be able to proceed with the case. So that April, Melissa was released from the Floridian prison and was deported back to Canada. She moved into an apartment building in New Glasgow meant for senior citizens, where she promised to stay out of trouble. That would not last long. Soon, a 75-year-old man moved in four doors down from Melissa, and she could not resist him. His name was Fred Weeks, and his wife had just died about a year prior. He was adjusting to life on his own, but slowly, and was rather lonely. Many of the elderly residents in the building came together to play the card game cribbage and do other social activities together. Soon, Fred met Melissa, and after some time, the two began to attend these events together as a couple. The pair's romance was quick, and soon the two wanted to get married. They had a small ceremony attended by Fred's son and Fred's friend named George. At the time, Melissa was going by the name Millie Ann Russell. Perhaps this is why no one batted an eye when the pair's romance began. George had heard of the story of Melissa Ann Shepard, but did not realize the two were one and the same. When he discovered her true identity, he tried to warn authorities, but there was nothing they could do as no crime had been committed. In September of 2012, Fred and Melissa spent their honeymoon in Newfoundland for a few days before deciding to drive back to New Glasgow. However, they weren't feeling very well after the ferry back from Newfoundland, so they decided to spend the night at a bed and breakfast nearby. Melissa explained to the owner of the bed and breakfast, who was named Cheryl, that she and her husband Fred had been up all night vomiting due to the nausea from the ferry. Cheryl noted that Fred looked incredibly ill, but Melissa looked fine, and she said that she was beautifully groomed with a lovely red suit. She did not look like someone who had been sick all night. The couple spent all day in their room, and Fred was still feeling incredibly sick. The next day, Melissa considered taking Fred to the hospital, as his condition was not improving. Cheryl offered to call an ambulance, but Melissa rejected this offer, saying that she wanted to finish her breakfast first, as it would likely be a long day in the hospital. Cheryl called an ambulance anyway, and Fred was taken to the hospital. While Fred was there, Melissa headed back to New Glasgow. 
Though they'd just been married a few days before Fred fell ill, their marriage was later ruled invalid after authorities discovered supposedly false information provided on their marriage certificate. In 2013, Melissa was charged with attempted murder, but she eventually pled guilty to lesser charges and received a sentence of three to three and a half years in prison. Police had found an extensive drug collection in her possession, mainly lorazepam and temazepam, which are benzodiazepines, which she had gathered from five different doctors under multiple different identities. She was released in mid-March of 2016 on a number of strict conditions, and she was considered at high risk to reoffend. Less than a month after her release, Melissa was spotted at the Halifax Central Library using a computer to access the internet, which was against the conditions of her release. She was also found with a device capable of accessing the internet, which I'm assuming is a smartphone, which she was not allowed to have. She was charged with breaching the terms of her release, but shocker, these charges against her were eventually dropped. As of now, there have not been any news stories about Melissa in a long time, which I frankly find is a good thing, because if we were hearing about her name, it would probably be for something bad. This case bothers me for a lot of reasons, mainly because she was able to get away with the same thing over and over again, yet cases were always dropped because of the lack of evidence. The jail sentences she received were laughably short, and she preyed on the lonely and vulnerable, with most of her victims being older than her, all of them elderly. And the jail sentences were just, they did not reflect the crime. She got measly years for killing people. (laughs) I just hope that the victims' families were able to find peace after what they went through, because a person like Melissa does not deserve to be free. And maybe she'll see this video, maybe she won't. I don't think she will, because she doesn't have access to the internet, but... Who knows? She's someone like her is uh, the police think she's very likely to reoffend. So it it seems like she'll probably who knows? She's very old right now, but that doesn't mean anything. You know, she could still be preying on someone right now and we just have no idea. Anyways, thank you all for watching. I hope you enjoyed my first video. Comment below on your ideas for future topics and I'll add them to my ever growing list. If you like this channel, please consider liking the video or subscribing to be notified about future uploads. But if you can't wait until then, check out my TikTok, Sir Jom Tones, where I'm usually active every day making shorter videos. Until next time, I'm Sam, and thank you for watching!